Dr. Paul Elevitz is past president of the International Psychohistorical Association. He was a co-founder of our organization. He has founded and organized the Psychohistory Forum for over 30 years. And is the founder and editor of Clio Psyche. Paul is one of the original faculty members at Ramapo College, where he currently teaches. Since 1976, he has written psychohistorical accounts of every presidential election. He has also attended every single conference of the International Psychohistorical Association since its founding. He is eminently qualified to speak on the future of psychohistory. Thank you. I'll give you this when you have five minutes, okay? Thank you. <clears throat> At all those meetings, I've given one to three presentations since our first meeting 39 years ago. This is the first time I'm coming with longitis for my allergies, so please let me know if I have to speak closer to the uh, microphone. The, uh, and Sheldon Solomon is a hard act to follow. I loved his combination of knowledge uh, and humor and not relying on the paper. That's not me. Uh, the next agenda of psychohistory, reflections on how people and society change. Originally, when I submitted my presentation proposals for a psychohistory next assignment, uh, for its future, I had in mind a detailed discussion of the following issue, and I call in arms to my colleagues to join in the endeavor. <coughs> uh, those issues are the complex processes and ambivalence in which the, uh, in the acceptance of minorities and women as equals and even as leaders. Two, changing genders in America. People are literally doing it. It's not just unisex anymore. An exploration of celebrity culture and its impact. TV and digital communication as object relations. Our emotional attachment to fantasy. The impact of digital communication on our youth and our world. Individualism, dependency, and interdependency in the family, politics, and society. Images and the psychology of enemies and hatred through the ages. The contemporary American fascination with other animals. Anti-government fantasies and civilization. Global species consciousness among the internet generation. Steps towards renunciation of genocide, killing, and war. These are very important subjects since they relate to the future of human beings in our complex, ever-changing, and dangerous society. They're well worth pursuing. However, when I actually sat down to write my paper, I found myself focusing on a much more limited group of subjects, some of which I will cover below, and others you can read about in the symposium, which if I sent out to my colleagues and sent to you if you'd like to write a commentary. Um, the symposium on how people and society changes. Um, these are the type of subjects we love to publish in our 23-year-old journal, Cleo Psyche, which the Psychohistory Forum uh, as sponsors. Uh, one of Psychohistory's greatest challenges, ideals in slavery, is the first section. One of Psychohistory's greatest challenges is to explain the enormously rapid transformation of attitudes, behavior, and law on a variety of subjects including uh, children, democracy, homosexuality, human individual rights, slavery, tolerance, women's rights. Uh, some of the agent, agents facilitating change that I probe in no particular order include empathy, ideas, some of which become ideals, improved childhood, intergeneration, rebelliousness, and technology. The struggle, <coughs> the struggle to change was and is familial and intrapsychic as well as societal. So, how people and societies change is a central question. 
Does the idea of change come first, or is, is the change itself come and then the idea follows? A prime example of the power of ideals, the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights at Eleanor Roosevelt is uh, holding up a Spanish edition um, of the uh, listing it. Uh, at the time of this uh, declaration, there were few actual democracies in the world in which citizens had individual and group rights. Today, most countries at least have the trimmings of democracy, uh, which include granting individual and political rights, rights, including the secret ballot. Of course, only about 15% of the world have uh, you know, effective democ democracies in the sense that what America would, what Americans would call true democracy, where you can really express your ideas. Furthermore, when these, this idea was put forth by a committee headed by Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, the leading democracy of the United States uh, had legal segregation this, uh, and laws against this, uh, miscegenation. Traditional slavery was still legal in Saudi Arabia and Yemen until 1974. Uh, of course, laws must be enforced as well as passed. And in many parts of the world, there's still de facto slavery, but not legal slavery. Now, during the latter years of enlightenment of the 18th century, the idea of abolishing legal slavery flourished in Western Europe. The idea of treating some humans as property was questioned in the age of reason. Excuse my longitis, it sounds as bad to you as it does to me. I feel sorry for your ears. You sound like the Godfather. <laughs> <laughs> um, large, please get that, Ken. Large numbers of pamphlets were written denouncing the practice, some by former slaves, uh, such as uh, Lada Equiano, um, who who was also a slave himself at one point. People were beginning to see slaves as human beings, not just as property. <coughs> there was slavery in all the 13 colonies uh, that rebelled against Parliament uh, and long, uh, and the king that, but the idea of, uh, of it being morally wrong was already beginning to take, take headway among Quakers and some intellectuals. Uh, Benjamin Franklin, uh, one of my uh, childhood heroes, uh, <clears throat> owned at least seven slaves and published advertisements for the sale of slaves <coughs> and the capture of runaways. Simultaneously, however, he also was publishing Quaker pamphlets denouncing slavery and was privately questioning the institution. Eventually, he became a critic of the plantation system of slavery and a cautious abolitionist. His thinking was influenced by traveling in England, uh, uh, where there were many people questioning the, uh, the institution. Uh, now, importantly, the rhetoric of freedom involved denunciation, denunciation of slavery. Indeed, Thomas Jefferson want to include that specifically, uh, uh, that the colonists were being enslaved by the Brits uh, in the Declaration of Independence. Cooler minds such as Ben Franklin uh, dissuaded him, since they as rebels, uh, who owned sl slaves in so many cases, were a morally dubious position regarding America's own peculiar institution, uh, that is slavery. By 1770, Franklin uh, uh, attacked the international slave trade and the plantation system of slavery and freed his own slaves. However, during the 1787 Constitutional Convention, he would not publicly debate the violation uh, of slavery and tended to equivocate on the whole issue. The founding fathers would constitutionally renounce indentured servitude which typically meant four to seven years of labor in exchange for transport from England, but not slavery of the other, that is blacks and Native Americans. Of course, by that point, there weren't too many indentured servants. 
but there were a lot of slaves, especially in the South. The ideal of freedom for all, renunciation of slavery, ran up against the best interest of the colonists' possession of slaves as property. Uh, the acceptance of slavery as a necessary condition of forming a single uh, American nation rather than a southern slavocracy and a separate northern uh, free society was, in a sense, the original sin uh, of the American nation. The Declaration of Independence is the founding document of this extraordinary birth of freedom that would help transform the world, inspire the world. Yet the contradiction between the ideals and behavior uh, is found quite dramatically in its author. Thomas Jefferson, on the one hand, authored one of the greatest statements of freedom from servitude, and the other hand, was utterly dependent on slaves for his economic well-being. Uh, his French revolutionary friend, Gilbert de Montier, Marquis of Lafayette, would marvel at, at how Jefferson could speak at, at length about freedom amidst the toil of slaves during uh, his extended stays in Monticello. <laughs> Jefferson's revolutionary ideas were, uh, went up against his economic, emotional, familial ties to institution, as well as his personality. His economic dependence on slave was heightened by his constant debt. Much uh, of it was because he was purchasing costly books, including some of those on freedom, as well as maintaining the expenses, expensive lifestyle expected of a Virginia gentleman farmer. Even George Washington, uh, sorry Jefferson, I missed you for a bit. Uh, the, uh, uh, would uh, had his servants and other staples of Jefferson's lifestyle while leading his starving, frostbitten soldiers at uh, Gettysburg. Jefferson's personality must be taken into consideration, understanding his behavior, and the incredible gap between his ideals and his reality. Bullying by an older boy who lived with him during his formative adolescence left his mark. Aside from impersonal conversations, uh, he moved his colleagues by his literary elegance, not by his squeaky voice. This is why, as president, he sent rather than delivered the State of the Union address uh, to Congress, starting a precedent that would continue uh, until Wilson broke it over 100 years later. He was a very retentive personality, could not easily give, give up, let go of his valued possessions including slaves. Familial considerations complicate his relationship with some of the <coughs> slaves. His beloved wife, uh, uh, Martha, uh, uh, was, he was extraordinarily devoted to, often refusing to leave home to serve the revolutionary cause <coughs> he was ill or expect, when she was ill or expecting a child, uh, much to the frustration of Washington and his colleagues. Sometime in the course of mourning Martha's death, he found solace in her half-sister, Sally, which resulted in uh, six children. Um, this uh, Sally uh, was the slave of, of Martha, um, would come with her as a 10-year-old with her 18-year-old brother, James Hemming, um, also a, a son of, of her father, uh, that is, of Ma Martha's father, uh, to Monticello. Uh, and this, um, uh, and so devotion uh, to the sister of his beloved wife, uh, dead wife, um, uh, you, know, you know, resulted in considerable emotional and, of course, a sexual bond. Uh, Jefferson was caught between conflicting demands of his position of American politician and his private emotional life uh, and his uh, universal revolution ideal <coughs> public political persona. When American uh, historians stopped simply idealizing Jefferson for his enormous achievements, contributions, 
for the birth and nurturance of the nation and his ideals, they began to acknowledge that he was a man who lived with and had children by his late, late wife's half-slave sister. Fawn Brody, a UCL pioneer psychohistorian, UCLA that is, uh, an author of Tom, Thomas Jefferson, an intimate uh, history, uh, was uh, totally denounced by the Jefferson establishment uh, for uh, putting into print uh, what had been part of the oral tradition of descendants of Jefferson uh, and finding uh, lots of additional evidence. Um, our New York psychohistorical colleague, uh, Lee Snydman, um, uh, spelled out Jefferson's secretness and duplicity in his book, Leading from Weakness, Jefferson Overt and Covert Relation with Spain and the Barbary States. Regrettably, Lee died before he could publish, and he never even gave uh, a presentation on the subject to this group, uh, though it did to the psychohistory forum. Jefferson's life was complicated by events in Europe. Uh, he was thrilled by the French Revolution of 1789 uh, uh, and was very eager uh, to uh, observe it firsthand and serve his country as minister to France. The revolution had renounced slavery uh, and that fit ideologically with his beliefs, but it complicated his emotional and economic life. He took Sally Hemings and her brother James with him, uh, brother as manservant, and once they landed, these two uh, were legally free. Both debated should we stay in France. To avert this, Jefferson promised freedom uh, to them after they returned to America. For James was after him. James learned how to cook in the French style and then trained someone else to serve in his place back in Virginia. And James wasn't he freed in 1796, but became an alcoholic and committed suicide in 1801 after doing, uh, you know, after uh, having served uh, Jefferson Moore. Sally would only be informally freed by Jefferson's daughter sometime <coughs> after his death in 1826. Uh, to, according to one of, uh, of Sally's children, uh, their children, I should say, uh, two Jefferson Hemings children who were seven-eighths Caucasian and their mother were listed in 1833 uh, Virginia County Census as white. Clearly they passed and uh, those conflicting pictures, one uh, of uh, Sally uh, reflect different images. I, mean, I don't think we really have uh, exact images. These are portraits, if, I, if my recollection is correct, from um, accounts of them. And of course, Jefferson knew <coughs> incredibly little about Sally. Now, George, uh, George Washington, uh, whose picture I can't find here, but you know what he looks like, so check out a different day. Uh, owned slaves his entire life and did not make pronouncements about any institution, though privately uh, he sort of regretted it. Uh, the leader of the war for colonial freedom was quite disturbed when some of his own slaves ran, ran away. During the war, the Brits were promising safety and freedom to any slave who escaped from a rebel master and promised a home for them in Sierra Leone. Um, in his will, Washington provided that his own slaves be freed upon the death of his wife Martha, which in fact they were. Her <coughs> large num larger number of slaves were sold out after her death, uh, were put on the block and sold like cattle. In the early years of the Republic, there were some among the founding fathers who hoped that slavery would die out in the new nation. However, when the Yankee Eli Whitney's invention, the Yankee Eli Whitney invention of the cotton gin, 1793, the cotton became king in the South, 
and strengthen the stagocracy. Now, both the American and the French revolutions uh, were outgrowths of the Enlightenment. And that idea that there were universal rights is a central concept of modern man. Professor Lynn Hunt of UCLA, a past president of the American Historical Association and a Cleo Psyche featured scholar, discussed uh, this development, Inventing Human Rights in History. Over oh, it's one thing to proclaim human rights, quite another to both make them a reality and explore their implications. It takes a number of generations to explore the implications once a right is, is uh, actually put into law. <coughs> the Founding Fathers instituted many rights in the American Constitution while mentioning slavery only uh, in the context of giving more voter power, voting power to slave states by counting slaves as three-fifths of a person for electoral purposes. They had proclaimed the republic uh, with individual rights but in the minds of most of these founding fathers, uh, a democracy would, would constitute a mobocracy. They couldn't accept this notion. Uh, and that wouldn't come to effect uh, until later. Uh, as those of us who are psychotherapists who have been in therapy know, change is usually a slow, difficult process <laughs> within a person. Societal change can sometimes be uh, quite rapid, as in the French Revolution, but change actually take root is a much more daunting process, a complex process. The abolition of the slavery, slavery in the northern states, the number of the enslaved was, was not great, was a slow process, process that involved dealing with vested interests. Most of the founding fathers uh, knew that they could not push too hard and fast which is why they did not attempt to deal with this divisive issue uh, of the abolition of slavery, um, even though many felt badly about it. Okay. The technology in its general generational change, or am I talking too long? Uh, probably I should follow uh, Sheldon Solomon's example and just go directly to questions and answers. How does that work for you? Yeah, okay. So, uh, I'll, uh, I won't cover, but you can read uh, if, you're, if you're doing the uh, part of the symposium uh, on change. This section and uh, the one on childhood and other things that are uh, empathy, inclusion, and childhood. And a lot more. This my paper today is an extract from that uh, longer symposium paper. So, what questions do you have? Okay, thank you. <laughs> well, this topic of slavery reminds me that uh, as a young child, I felt uh, as if I was a slave. In fact, I remember learning the. Uh, Management anthem and the end of it, uh, the home of the free and the, and the, the land of the, the, the land of the brave. Yes, I felt that it, it didn't apply to me. I was not brave enough <coughs> to uh, to find my parents. So, would it, do you want to comment on an extension from slavery down to uh, to, uh, to other? people, but with the slavery of children to their parents. How about of parents to their children? That's a lot of hard work to raise kids, and the most important thing I've ever done. Uh, but uh, uh, what you say reminds me of, uh, of the quote from Blumenthal's uh, book on Abe Lincoln that just came out, uh, which um, when Lincoln said in 1856, I was once a slave, referring to being uh, rented out, in effect, by his father to, to neighbors and not getting anything for it uh, himself.
to split logs and do other heavy farm work. And um, I suspect children uh, generally at times feel enslaved. Um, the, uh, in, in doing child therapy, trying to think if any ever um, said that uh, to me, but they had certainly had the emotion of being enslaved. Uh, and uh, I remember throughout most of history, children are there to serve the parents. Uh, as Floyd de Moss uh, pointed out so well in the evolution of childhood and some of his early work. Um, yes? I have more of a, a comment, and it, it also goes uh, about uh, child rearing. And I remember uh, hearing a presentation at NAP uh, probably more than 10 years ago uh, by, I forget the first name, Yuka was the last name, uh, Who's Binding the Children, it, which was a, a study of the history of child rearing. And it was interesting because her uh, synopsis was that child rearing is such a laborious process that uh, if you look at history, all different kinds of relationship models uh, were used but it was usually what was dictated by the economics of the parents, how they could raise children, and that uh, afterwards, after the fact, the local experts of the day, whether they were priests or psychologists or still somebody else, would come in and explain why the present arrangement, which was really dictated by economics, was the very best that could possibly be. So it, it was really, the theory of child rearing uh, was a rationalization of what had to happen uh, for economic reasons. Uh, it's very often uh, the case uh, to children on the farm or growing up in a, uh, a family business. Uh, I keep thinking of a uh, when I was at a nursery once, and this five-year-old kid was so taking such delight in uh, pushing heavy uh, bushes uh, to the back of the truck. Uh, to help and load them. And I think of my, my pride and joy in being able to finally be able to sweep my parents' store, my big brother's job. And of course, they yelled, don't, you're raising dust, Paul, you're raising <laughs> dust. Uh, and uh, uh, so there was a lot of, uh, it's, it's a mixed bag. In, in some ways, much easier to grow up where you saw what your children did right up close, your parents did right up close, and you copied it uh, as children in so many cases. But of course, some wanting to do other things. Maybe Lincoln wanted to read books and so forth. Okay, um, Floyd. I was doing some research and writing on the <coughs> Ukraine-Russia crisis. There was another slave trade, which we don't talk much about, but between 1200 and into the 1700s, uh, more than two million Russians and Ukrainians were enslaved by Tatars and Turks, and often sold into Italian slave markets. <coughs> so there was a whole system of white slavery running in what's now Black Sea, Eastern Mediterranean area. And the Balkans, I cover <coughs> that. I cover one little aspect of that, but uh, also, we go back earlier, the, Slav the word Slavic is derived from slave <coughs> because the Byzantines uh, in the Eastern East Roman Empire were getting their slaves from, the, right. uh, from these people this, who became the Slavic people. Uh, you to the, the expression harvesting the steppe. It would send big raids up into what's Ukraine and Russia and harvest <coughs> the steppe. They would just collect people. Uh, horrendous, or the tax of having to give your your children in the Balkans, which is one reason for the extreme <coughs> Muslim attitudes of so many Serbs uh, to the uh, to the Ottoman government, who would then uh, become part of the Jangis, who would be converted to Islam, part of the Janissaries, the the army that would oppress them whenever they were rebellion, rebelling, uh, or be castrated and become actually, the, uh, in some cases, the, uh, the equivalent of the prime minister 
of the Sultan. So uh, there's an awful lot of that goes on Eastern Europe. Most of what we say about Europe, we really mean Western Europe. And it depends on time period, and more specifically, it's typically England and France, low countries, northern Italy. Other question, Jess? Yes. yes. <clears throat> Getting back to Tom Jeffers, he also had not only a French friend, Lafayette, who happened <coughs> to be a Freemason, Jefferson was not. Uh, he also had a Polish friend. His name was Thaddeus <coughs> Kosciuszko, one of my favorite bridges in Brooklyn, going under uh, construction now. Anyway, Kosciuszko, which is another way to pronounce his name, he was a rebel. He was, he liked the Freemason ideas of tolerance and uh, uh, the idea of equality and brotherhood. And uh, he came here to fight. And uh, he also happened to be an engineer and did a lot of things with West Point. But he also was a good friend of Tom Jefferson. He was invited to visit him in Monticello. And anyway, he didn't like the idea that he, Tom Jefferson had slaves. And he told him in a letter that if you guys don't, you know, do something about this problem, it's going to be a big problem. <coughs> and he also left money for a black school in case they decide to get rid of slavery, the slaves would be able to get an education. And he kept writing Jefferson uh, during hard times in, uh, in Europe, especially in Poland, because he was trying to lead a revolution over there. Didn't succeed. Yeah. But uh, he wanted to know what happened to the money that he left. Well, Jefferson kind of ignored him. Either way, Ted Tadeusz Kostusko should be mentioned as one of those uh, rebels who didn't quite be on the there's an incredible literature on Jefferson. And of course, he kept, uh, he invented a machine to copy any letter he sent because he wanted evidence of it, uh, which is how uh, part of what Lee Snyder used, uh, the, using these records to show the extent of his duplicity between his public statements and his private statements. Uh, he. Uh, he did have enormous problems. Calendar, um, who was who had worked a little bit for uh, Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans, as they were then, then called, uh, 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 had turned on Jefferson. It was well known uh, because you just had to take a look uh, at the uh, at the Hemings uh, uh, children to see that they, they had this other family resemblance here. So that was a uh, clearly a, a, a factor. I think emotionally, Jefferson was extremely connected uh, to Sally, and I suspect she was to him. Certainly, um, he was the father of of her four surviving two died children, two died as infants. Other questions? Yes, Ken. If your subject is how society has changed and the sub-subject part of that is in relationship to slavery. Is there a reason why you didn't talk as much about the about abolition of slavery in some of the northern states of, by the time the Constitution was adopted in the Arctic and the Northwest Territory law, and more about when the anti-slavery <coughs> movement was politically prominent in the North? Time. Time and, of course, lack of knowledge because it's complex, you have to go state by state. I know in New Jersey, um, it wasn't till the beginning of the 19th century where they formally abolished slavery, uh, provided you know, no, a slave child would no longer be a, uh, would no longer be a slave, would be free. Because uh, you have to provide for vested interest to a degree. And I think it was not long before the Civil War when the last uh, New Jersey slave had died. Uh, it's, 
polit politicians deal with vested interest, uh, and uh, it's complex. And I know it, it varies from state to state in the in northern colonies, and uh, of course, uh, at some points there were a lot of slaves, especially in Pennsylvania, and of course, Delaware and Maryland uh, were, we think about them northern now, but they're below the Mason Dixon line. Uh, yes? Yeah. I would think that to focus on change, or the, the dynamic, <coughs> dynamic of change is very important because one uh, cultural phenomenon is change. And in our lives, it changes several times. In earlier times, it's much slower. One king came, again go away, next king coming, and the pope is eternal, and so there Maybe there is a connection to the uh, denial of death or the anxiety of death. <coughs> Change means deny, uh, the dying of the old coming to a new frame. And this is a very difficult process. I think it is a broad field, and it is very important that, and maybe it's a chance for us, of, like historians, to understand more the dynamics of change, because uh, the problems of the Arabic world and the, in the global world are the problems of change. How can we manage change not by uh, wars or restaging fetal traumas <laughs> and so on, and how we can manage change by negotiations and so on, and why is this so difficult? Well, it is in part because what what is you've internalized uh, is now being threatened by the change. Mm -hmm. uh, the and very difficult, and the rapidity of change in the section that I uh, chose not to go into among the younger generation is enormous, you know, just extraordinarily rapid. And now, um, and change is spreading with lightning speed throughout the world, and this is it's very threatening, yeah. uh, and so easy to blame the other, which you, you have. Uh, as far as combining um, the denial of death with the subject, I'd love to. Uh, I'd love to get someone who who has uh, who written a paper on the subject to sit around for a typical psychoist reform meeting, where people read the paper ahead of time, and in a group of I don't know, 12 to 20, uh, however many people show up that day, we. The person doesn't talk for more than 50 or 20 minutes, and then we, we spend the rest of the time discussing the issue, looking for the implications, developing them, because uh, you can work in much greater depth that way. And Floyd had another question. The, um, the issue of the lack, like what is the popular psychology of why the United States still has a lack of acknowledgement of slavery. For example, the acknowledgement of what? Slavery, the yes. institution of slavery. We have a museum to the Holocaust. Canada is right now building a museum to the victims of communism. But the victims of slavery, I know there's a couple of states that made slave museums, but still as a nation, we don't have the full acknowledgement of what was slavery in terms of museums, uh, that kind of display in our history. Um, so we have, we have Jefferson Memorial. We have these monuments still to these people. But we have no institutional memory and memorialization in stone of what was this theater business. I think there are a number of reasons we're just beginning to to really delve into uh, accepting um, African Americans as equals. You see the incredible ambivalence. Dave Bizell wrote a brilliant article uh, before uh, Obama came into office about all the fantasies, how he, because he was different, um, that he would be able to change society. Uh, and uh, the 
uh, conservatives said, no way will we cooperate with this man. And, uh, but the broader, it's very difficult, it's difficult for a lot of Americans to have a, uh, a biracial president, even if he is, uh, he was raised uh, by white grandparents and white mother and um, only chose to adopt the black identity uh, when he was off in college in Southern California. But the, um, the it's enormous uh, kettle of worms in terms of reparations uh, that uh, the people don't want to open that can of worms. Uh, and But yet, uh, we're struggling with being politically correct. I think a lot of Trump's uh, support is based on people being tired of being PC, especially having to do with African Americans and so many other issues. Uh, why can't you just hate people in the middle of the way? Uh, is what a lot of people yearn for. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, I, uh, yeah, there's an article in uh, Atlantic Magazine there, there's another one on uh, uh, in the Atlantic by Dan. His last name is escaping me. Uh, one of the uh, who does presidential traits and psychological traits that has some good material. But he misses up. Uh, it's the I think it's like two weeks ago. Um, uh, the uh, uh, going into what sort of president would uh, Trump be, but that's for tomorrow. Well, if I have, we have voice, time for one more question. Okay. Uh, otherwise, yes. Ken will yeah. tomorrow will read my paper on yes, I will. Uh, comparing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take comparing one more. Hillary and, and the Donald. Uh, we'll take yes. one more question. Yeah. Can you take two minutes uh, to talk a little bit about the history of psychological traits and how they because um, I, I love this organization, and it's the uh, general population is my age, you know, and um, I'm wondering how, how can we get more people interested in, in cyber history? Uh, well, I, I've only been working on that for a half century. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> The, there's a Cambridge University Press book on psychology and history where I have a, a chapter that has a lot of that history as a field goes back to discussions of in the Freud circle. And then Meredith quickly picked up on it. And some of in clear psyche, uh, I've got some articles on those early in the 19 teens, Americans who were doing psychohistory of Luther and, and of other people. Uh, it's a long, rich history of the organized field. The first psychology groups don't start to well sleep with Lifton uh, in 1964, uh, yeah, approximately. And I'm hoping Robert J. Lifton will live forever and well sleep will keep going, uh, uh, even though they don't formally call themselves a psychology group. Uh, they do a branch of it. Uh, it's, it's a rich field that hasn't been embraced by academia, but when people need certain <coughs> insights, they come to our literature in the past and sometimes to organizations. Thank you very much.